Everett, thank you so much for uh, for joining me today, man. I know it's I'm fresh, 9 a.m. here in Nashville. It's 5 p.m. in Beirut, where you are in Lebanon. But um, yep. regardless, I think we can have a pretty good conversation, man. I, I guess just for anybody watching, I'll provide a little bit of context. So you reached out to me, I think it was either through YouTube or Instagram. I think both simultaneously, probably. Mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, Instagram, yeah. Instagram, you came across some of my videos. I'm not really sure how you found them, but you came across something and it, I think it just resonated with you. It was something that you had a lot of interest in. I mean, do you remember what in particular you found? Uh, yeah, definitely. It was, uh, I mean, it was here and you talk about the Tri Pillar Project. And it was when uh, you guys brought Randall Carlson out to, I, I follow a bunch of his videos and um, yeah. and I saw this video inside y'all's lodge and, and Sylvan Park that I'd been there once for an open day, um, just for a dinner you guys did. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I grew up right down the road from that lodge and both my, my middle school and my high school are within like half a mile from there. So it was like, uh, and then I saw you guys were talking about all these, the, these topics that I'm deeply interested in and that I've, you know, there's not really many people that talk about these things or at least not in my immediate life. So I, I really just wanted to share with you some of my stories and some of these bizarre things I've seen and also to see if there was any way I could be a part of the tri Filler project and, and yeah, just keep listening to your lectures and contribute whatever weird facts I've picked up along the way. And yeah, uh, yeah, I just really like what you're doing and the things you have to say about it. Yeah, man, you sent me some like incredible messages, like very well thought out. Um, and it was, it warmed my heart to read them to connect with you, man, because I kind of, I knew that when I when I read the messages that you sent me, based on the topics that you touched on in that message, I knew that you and I were going to get along. And um, yeah, I just thought it was very interesting how we came across each other. It's funny, man, because like when it comes to tech, I've got a love hate relationship with it. You know, I think that like the cell phone uh, has like had some severe consequences in the social world. Um, but at the same time, man, like without tech, you and I wouldn't be talking right now uh, if it wasn't for social media and things like that. So I guess, uh, you know, we have to give some to get some. But uh, yeah, man, well, I guess, you know, you said you're from Nashville. Could you just, I guess, el elaborate on being from Nashville, you know, and how you ended up in Lebanon doing what you do now, which is Arabic calligraphy, which is quite quite interesting i mean you're the first arabic calligrapher i've ever met you're the second calligrapher i've ever met period so it's like an, it's an extraordinarily niche unique thing at least in my eyes that you're doing um a very cool art and i would love to kind of hear more about how you found it um well it's kind of a convoluted story uh I, at 18, I left Nashville uh, to go study in Scotland, and I did a degree in international business in Arabic. And then they sent me to Damascus, Syria in 2009. And uh, so that's where I first started learning calligraphy. I was just taking private lessons uh, in the old city on this this kind of famous street, Camarilla Street. And uh, yeah, I just kind of fell in love with it. It was how I wanted to spend my time. And at three university I had jobs to pay you know, um, you know, things like bar jobs that, you know, we're never really passionate about. Um, and yeah, I just started putting some work online on eBay and Etsy and sites like that. And it started selling prints and it kind of, yeah, moved to Lebanon in 2011 and haven't really looked back. It's been my only, only job since then. So how, how'd you go from being, uh, I mean, I don't, is your fam is your family Arabic? Like, how did you end up studying Arabic? in college, what led you to learn that language? Well, I did, uh, you know, I studied international business and at university because, uh, you know, my, my parents, my dad was kind enough to pay for my studies. And uh, and I think he would have been a little disappointed if I studied art. So I wanted to do something more practical. Um, and they, 
at Edinburgh, they offer international business with a language and you can pick, you know, between all the European languages. And, and the only one that was kind of off the track was Arabic. But I, I figured I couldn't, you know, I could learn French or Spanish just on, uh, you know, Rosetta Stone or Duolingo or something like that. But uh, I figured, you know, you'd need some university help for Arabic. So I thought that was just kind of the most, uh, you know, the the most exotic, I guess, of, of what was offered. And uh, and yeah, I didn't really know much about the Middle East. Um, I mean, and actually in, in high school, I had this art class. Um, I was taught by this lady, Rosie Pascal, who's, um, you know, kind of a goddess of art in my eyes. But uh, I mean, it, and she was even the reason I went to MBA because, uh, yeah, one of the guys in my neighborhood, you know, it, NBA is kind of known for that sort of jock mentality. And they kept talking about this lady, Rosie Pascal, that they studied art with. Um, and it was just a phenomenal class. I mean, I and I never thought I'd have any kind of career in art. But um, but in my senior year, I had a class with just two kids. It was me and this guy, Dinesh. And he'd shown some pictures that his uncle had done, um, of these pictures of falcons and birds drawn in, in a very traditional Arabic calligraphy. Uh, so that was really my only, that was really my first introduction uh, to Arabic calligraphy. And then I didn't really think about it again twice until I, I was in, uh, yeah, in Damascus and some friends of mine were taking lessons from this guy. So I thought I'd, I'd try it out and I, yeah, I just, I, I feel really relaxed just practicing and uh yeah it was just a good outlet it was very meditative and uh yeah it was it was a way I could yeah also earn a living from doing something I enjoy so it's you know it's not a lucrative lifestyle but it's also you know I can work in my pajamas if I want to <laughs> yeah yeah definitely so were you I mean in Nashville were you engaged in art as frequently as you are now, or has this been like a shift for you? Um, well, art was always my favorite subject in school. And, uh, you know, MBA is an all boys school. So I did a lot of theater in high school because that's where the girls were. It was the only uh, co-ed activity. So in terms of the arts in high school, I was, I was really active in theater. Um, but art was, you know, the, the fine art or the printmaking or this kind of uh, the technical art was always my the, the thing I was most excited about. Uh, but I never, you know, I never believed you could make money as an artist. That was going, always in the back of my head is, you know, everybody wants to be an artist, but nobody really is. Um, yeah. And I don't know very, you know, I know of several calligraphers, actually, that this has been their only job since university. But uh, I don't really know of any other artists or any other non-calligraphy artists that have managed to make a living of it. Uh, so I do think Arabic calligraphy is kind of unique in that in that sense. Uh, there's high demand and uh, yeah, not enough uh, supply. So are, are you are you Muslim? Uh, no, no, I've never been Muslim. I've never claimed to be Muslim. Uh, I was born and raised Catholic, and uh, you know, like most. 15 year old kids, you know, I was kind of, you know, very annoyed with having to go to church and was, uh, uh, yeah, just that kind of rebellious child that, you know, fell out with the church, you could say. Um, and then more recently, when, uh, you know, when I met my wife and uh, been learning a lot more about her family's religion and the, uh, well, and Hinduism and the Vedas. And uh, and as a kid, I was always deeply fascinated. I always loved classical history. I, I loved reading about the old gods and the old Greek myths. And um, and then just seeing how, you know, one of the first things are was asking about, you know, the religion. And they and again, they never really force it on me. I mean, they even kind of say there's not really such a thing as a conversion, but. Um, but it was, you know, it's like, you know, here's these rituals that we do. You can take it or leave it, whether or not, um, you know, whether or not you believe it. Um, for them, that's kind of a secondary point. But uh, and that was a big part of their, you know, the fact that, you know, they've been doing this a certain way for so many thousand years that, you know, 
if it's not broke, don't fix it, I guess would be the, the best way of saying that. Yeah. And, um, and even, so yeah, I mean, I guess in, in terms of practice, I, I try to, uh, you know, I, I try to follow their protocols or their, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I wear the thread, I, I stopped eating meat, I, um, you know, I do pray, uh, I've been trying to learn Sanskrit, learn the prayers and, uh, you know, do my daily puja and that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and again, like we, we talk about faith in the, in the Catholic church or the Christian church. Um, uh, whereas I, it's almost a secondary priority. Um, the more I read about Hinduism or, and not to say that I don't have faith, but I mean, even her, you know, my, my wife's mom who's extremely devout and, you know, it's kind of an example for me of how to, to practice, um, you know, they, there's this concept of agenda versus credenda. And, and you know, even she'll tell me these stories that she'll refer to as, as myths, um, you know, these different religious stories that have a very significant meaning to them. But a lot of them that, you know, there's no illusions there as to, you know, whether this was a flesh and blood person that did this thing at that time versus here's a story that's going to have useful repercussions in your life and that you can learn a lesson from this if you if you pass on these stories um and so for me yeah it's more i mean i, I kind of have this belief that religion is just art and idiom and it's all religions we kind of believe the same thing but we uh, we have different cultural practices or rituals different art and a different language that we we tell these stories in but i think fundamentally um uh, they're all kind of the same stories. Um, so I, I know it kind of sounds weird to say, but the more I learn about uh, my in-law's religion, you know, that's almost given me more faith in the church, if, if that can even make sense. I mean, I I understand why we have these stories that we have and, and the value that they bring and the beauty they bring to our life. Um, so, yeah, I, don't, I mean, I know that, that might create more questions than it answers, but I think. Uh, no, I, I I feel like I really understand yeah, I, I, what you're trying to get. I try to live according to their. Yeah, no, I am. I, um, I understand what you're saying. Let me let me see if let me see if I can phrase it in a way that makes sense. So, yeah, I agree with you. I, you know, I've, I've always had the feeling that <clears throat> the religions of the world or all religion as we experience it is, is a, is a formula. It's spirit, some sort of source of information that is then passed through a human mind. And that human mind exists in various cultures around the world. And then through that human mind, that message is then transcribed and written down through the cultural lens of that person who is who is receiving it so i mean i guess like the the concept of a prophet would be the best way to look at this you know if if a if a muslim prophet receives a message and a hindu prophet receives a message from the same god same being whatever even if that message is the same or if it came from the same place, it seems to me like because those two people live in different places, have different cultural minds, that message would be tra transcribed differently at the end of it, even though it came from the same place. So mm -hmm. I think I think that's what you're saying, right? Well, yeah, I mean, definitely. And, and even, I mean, and I think there's a lot of cases where it's not even that different i mean uh and you know in terms of the bible revelations was always my favorite book just because it was so surreal and it was you know written like this acid trip kind of yeah and then you know i learned actually from randall carlson when he's um you know he's looking into the vedas and these different um verses in the rig veda and it has these you know the four horsemen of the apocalypse and it's the same the same riders of the horses you know death pestilence they come from the same directions, the color of the horse is the same. Um, you hear the, the horn blasting in the same references. So 
this idea that, uh, yeah, I mean, how did, I guess it was James the Lesser that gave us revelations, or, or maybe John. Uh, but yeah, I mean, how, how did the Rishis come up with this same message that, that John, I believe it was John that wrote Revelations. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, 2,000 years apart and 4,000 miles difference. How, how did they come to the same? How did both of those books reach us today? For me, there's, I mean, there's definitely has to be something true and, and sacred in that. And, uh, and going back to this, you know, religion as art and idiom, uh, I don't know if you read much of the classics or Mar Marcus Aurelius or these um, different writers from the Greco-Roman world, but, but they had this concept of agenda and credenda. And I know as so agenda is, is what you do, what how you practice, you know, the, the rituals you do, the prayers you say, where you perform them and in what order, et cetera. And then the credenda is what you believe inside. And And for the Romans, I think their religion was much more about I mean, and they said explicitly that, that the important part is the agenda. It's what you do. It's, you know, did you make this sacrifice at this temple on that day um, before you did this other thing? And it, it was more about there's a protocol of what we've done and that's worked well for this time versus uh, versus the Catholic or the, uh, you know, the, the Muslim way of thinking or the monolatrous way of thinking would be that, you know, it's, it's what's in your heart and in your mind. Yeah. And and so I think there is a way to, you know, square that circle of agenda versus credenda. But um you know, for instance, I'm having a I've got a baby girl due by the end of the year. And and so there's a lot of rituals we have to do in India as part of that um, you know, the firstborn, the first eating, these different uh the naming ritual. Uh but, you know, I'd really, I don't know if the church will let me, but I would certainly, I would like to have her baptized uh, in the States as well to to still uh, let her be a part of that tradition and, you know, let her know that, you know, she's come from a Hindu family, but she's also come from a Catholic family. Um, and, and I think it's important that we, you know, if nothing else, just to have that connection to our past and to have our our roots, you know, to know where we come from and to know and even if you know and what she chooses in terms of her faith you know that that's her decision but at least to give her the opportunity if the church says you're going to go to limbo if you don't get baptized Lewis, you know better better safe than sorry right <laughs> yeah yeah what do you what do you think is the um the value in because I, I mean, I believe the same thing. I think that, I think that knowing where you're from, knowing the traditions of of where you're from, your blood, um, having an awareness of the culture that your blood came from, I think it's all very important. But I, I guess I'd like to hear it from you because you're going. It sounds like you're willing to go to great lengths so that your child is is connected to that tradition. Like in your eyes, what role? does tradition and being connected to those traditions play in the health of a person? Well, I think, you know, I think anxiety, I mean, it's a, at least if they have a, you know, we, we all make our own path and we all, um, you know, we all chart our own course, but knowing that, there's two traditions that say, hey, here's a right way of doing things that have worked for us for 6,000 years or 2,000 years or whatever it is. Um, you know, you're, you're going to deviate from that course. Obviously, you know, I didn't come from a family of Arabic, but, you know, I at least I know when I'm deviating from that course. Um, uh, and so, I, yeah, I think it, you need a you need a jumping point and you know, the stronger platform you have to jump from, uh, probably the better. And, and I also don't feel like I have the right to, you know, my in-laws are, they've done it this, this way for so long. Like, who am I to say, no, we're not an old Vedic wedding. We're not, you know, um, 
you know, they raised this woman that I want to spend the rest of my life with. And so there's something right in that. I think of my mother's mother, my grandmother, and, you know, she, I think she's got, we're maybe up to seven or eight great grandkids of hers. I think three of them are named Eleanor. And, and, and I think that's because of, you know, what an example she led both in her faith and how she lived. And, uh, and, and she was never dogmatic. I mean, she was never, Hey, you got to live this way. You got to go to church on this day. She was much, you know, take it or leave it kind of thing. But, um, uh, that is the example she, she gave. So I, I feel like I, I owe it to everyone that came before me to destroy things. It's much harder to, uh, to preserve them or to keep them, you know, if you have down a hundred year old tree, you're going to have to wait another hundred years for that tree to regrow. Uh, so maybe it's better just to, to water the tree that's there and take care of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so I guess just to kind of backtrack for a moment, just so I can gain some context on where you're at in the route. I mean, you've been in Lebanon for over 10 years now. Um, what are some of the yeah, differences? That you, years, yeah. <laughs> what are some of the differences that you found in, in Lebanese culture uh, versus American Nashvilleian culture where you grew up. What are some of the things that stand out to you and just some of the things that you think are worth mentioning? Uh, I mean, I know it sounds cheesy to say, especially in the States today, but, uh, you know, family values are the, and not, I mean, the family values that has a very particular context in the States, but I mean, just the, centrality of the family here um i mean i think there's one nursing home in the whole country uh because the idea that you would you know let your parents go to a home you know rather than keeping them in your home and taking care of them this idea that you would just offload that duty to someone else um yeah i mean I, you know of course it's a capitalist country people care about money i think it's you know this is almost a you know the neoliberal wet dream in terms of the economy here but I still you know family is still the the fundamental unit of society in a way that uh, in a way that America is just about money I mean if you can you know family is important but it's really you know it, it seems like we are because the, I mean I don't know if it's the rat race or just keeping up or the amount of money it takes to survive in the states um it seems like that's our focus rather than rather than having children or uh you know we're kind of putting the court cart before the horse you could say um and so that's one thing that yeah just how the lebanese are with their with their families is much more um but even you know politically it's a very sectarian place you have um I think there's 17 different registered religions and each religion has described a certain number of seats in parliament. And, and so it's, you know, it's very sectarian and very racist in an almost comical way. Um, I mean, you have a million and a half Syrians here in a country of around 4 million or 5 million. Uh, nobody knows exactly because they won't hold the census. Um, because all of these seats in parliament were decided back in the forties and nobody wants to lose their parliamentary seats. If the census, uh, you know, comes up and says, Oh, there's not as many Maronites as there were before relative to the population. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there is this very much this sectarian identity, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, I guess that would be one thing that, uh, you know, I see the flack that my, my wife catches here as an Indian versus, you know, how I'm treated as an American is or it's almost black and white. Um, so that's definitely plays a role. Um, but again, it's, you know, it's uh, when everyone is a minority, no one feels secure in their uh, identity. Uh, so that, 
and and everyone is very much tied into into their religion, into their sect, in their uh, and, and so like you know if the average Maronite or the, like the average uh, Catholic here, if they can. I did seven years of Catholic school, and you know what I can learn from a Catholic year. They'll they'll be taught. I mean, they will have been taught so much more about theology than than we ever would have studied because it's very much you know you got to get in your trench and you got to identify with your people and uh and you know i think that can definitely be a very bad thing i mean there's you know there was a civil war fought for 20 years because of that um but again there is a you don't have this kind of bland monoculture that we've uh sort of gotten in the states whereas uh yeah i mean it's a I mean, it, I think it adds beauty, but it also adds conflict. I mean, and, and there's, uh, so you can take with that what you will. Uh, yeah, I think, um, I think what you brought up first about family values is perhaps even the most interesting thing. I mean, I think that when a when a when a nation state in a culture loses its um, not worship, but it's, um, what word do I want to use here? I'll just use the word appreciation. When a, when a culture loses its appreciation for the family unit, um, I just have observed that everything else or a lot of other things fall off once that's lost. Um, ethically, morally, socially culturally so i think that that's interesting how you brought that up um and you know it's really i really think that there's even a a, a, a darker agenda behind it in america now in the west because you know we're just getting these weird i mean there's there's this unusually large population of people online almost bragging about the fact that they don't want to have kids, you know, that mm -hmm. kids that they want to be free their whole life and they don't ever want to have to deal with the burden of having children. Yeah. It's framed like that and it's promoted like that. And sometimes these like, I see, I come across these videos every now and then that are getting a ton of hits where people are essentially framing having kids as a burden. And I think that this mindset, I don't, I don't know how long it's been around, but it's absolutely here. Um, and you'd even like, there's this place here in Nashville, Daddy's Dogs. You know, it's a hot dog place, Daddy's Dogs. And um, I mean, they were even giving away free hot dogs to guys who, had, who were snipped, who had vasectomies. <laughs> Like, How do they dude, know? You got to bring a. You got to bring a, a certificate. They just whip it out, man, and they just check it. But dude, like that. <laughs> that's really, really weird to me. Like the idea. I mean, it's almost something out of a, out of a Huxley novel. Like just the idea that there's a hot dog restaurant that will give you a free hot dog if you sterilize yourself. That just doesn't sit right with me. Like. It's just strange, like whatever, whatever led to that being a thing, um, I don't, it can't be good for culture. So I guess, you know, you have uh, your first child on the way. Um, as that moment approaches. And after this, I kind of want to get into some of the more mystical stuff, but as that moment approaches for you, you you've already mentioned the importance of family values. I mean, what what role do you think that family unit plays in society? And, and I mean, do you believe that it's like I do that it's absolutely necessary for a healthy society? Uh, well, I mean, again, we need, you know, do we just want to have society for the next 10 years until we all pass on or do we want to have something that will continue to grow? Um, and so I think, yeah, I mean, we we need children if we want society to continue. Um, and and I think what you said of, of whether or not this was a um, an agenda, I think 
the way it's played out in Lebanon, uh, just from the American perspective, there there definitely is an agenda there. Uh, so just like in the last maybe six months, you have this militia, which is kind of a, I mean, on their social media, I mean, they they brag about being this anti-LGBTQ militia um, that's kind of guarding the streets in Beirut and and uh, and and they, you know, and I found out recently from a friend that a lot of their funding actually comes from USAID, uh, like through through uh, not directly but through these other projects, and yet at the same time USAID will have other projects, you know, promoting trans visibility and LGBTQ rights in Lebanon. And and so I think it's more about dividing us and and finding ways to, you know, make us think that it's the LGBTQ community that's, you know, I, I don't think they're necessarily against family values. I mean, I, uh, you know, I think you, A, I mean, there's a lot of kids that, you know, for whatever parent, reason, their parents don't, don't want to raise them or can't raise them. And, you know, there are many gay couples out there that would like to adopt and and I think could still contribute. Uh, you know, the way we say family values has this kind of anti-LGBTQ context. And I don't I don't think that's necessary. I think it, you know, those two things don't have to be mutually exclusive, but I think it's also uh, taught to us in a way that it is. And and I, I think you know, I, I, everyone has this anxiety about the environment now where we're all worried about these global tipping points. And, and yeah, the number of people that have said to me, well, okay, I'm not going to have kids because that'll help my carbon footprint. And, and it's like, well, okay, what are we, you know, if there's no people here, what are we trying to save? Uh, you know, are we, are we trying to just upload our consciousness into the, into the cloud and then we'll, we'll watch the last two lions or, you know, it's, you know, what's the, what's the end game here? And it seems like it's just divisiveness more than, uh, more than creativity or, or positivity. Uh, and I mean, and it's not, I mean, that's the, the current state, but I mean, at one point I had a friend, like my ex-girlfriend was working for an NGO that was uh, also getting USAID money funneled almost directly to the Syrian regime. They told USA that the regime was embezzling like 85% of their funds. And and USA turned around and said, no, no, that's fine. Keep sending the keep sending the money. And then at the same time, my flatmate is he works for the rebels getting USA money to fund the opposite side of that conflict. So it's I think it's just, you know, keeping these conflicts going, keeping making sure everyone has a grievance to be upset about. Um and, and then there will be, you know, no one there to yeah, I mean, it, it, you start getting into conspiracy theories when you talk about motives and what could they want with all this. But yeah, uh, you know, we're we're doing the opposite of our own stated objectives, and so uh, yeah, what's the yeah, what the end game there is? That's yeah, beyond me. <laughs> yeah. Well, to get out of all the political bullshit, um, <laughs> I, I want to dive into some of this. What I mean, what I find to be far more interesting. Um, with some of the things we've talked about in regards to, you know, spirit, spiritual things, spirituality, the mysteries, some of these classical civilizations. Um, but I want to, I want to ask a particular question that I'm very curious to know the answer to in regards to your calligraphy. And I'll frame it by telling you about some of the things that I've come across in my studies. Um, one of the interesting phenomena that I've seen cross-culturally in, uh, in my journey through, you know, becoming aware of some of these things is the occurrence of language and letters in some traditions is being a, an extremely sacred thing. To the point where a Kabbalist would tell you that the Hebrew alphabet itself, without even knowing what it means or what the letter is, you can you can look at the shape of the letter and it will impart some sort of wisdom or power to you. Um, 
I've come across the same idea in regards to Nordic runes, where it's like the, the letters themselves, it's not, I mean, what you make with the letters is one thing, but the letter itself holds this intrinsic spiritual power, as they say. And I've always thought that was interesting because, you know, we don't really have that relationship with our alphabet anymore. I mean, there's really no like sacred feeling um, or feeling of awe that we give to our written language um, as I've experienced it. And I, I, I thought that that was so interesting, just the idea of having a relationship with the written language that is, you know, transcendent in a way. So I wanted to ask you, I've not studied Arabic, um, but do you feel like the language, I know that the, the language itself is very beautiful and it's very artistic. Would you say that, well, one, in regards to, you know, what these Kabbalists would say about the Hebrew alphabet and what, you know, people would say about the Nordic runes, do, do you believe through your relationship working with written language in an artistic form in a spiritualized framework do you believe that the alphabet that the letters themselves hold intrinsic power or do you do you believe that maybe that power is created once the words are put together i mean what, what is your relationship with written language now that you've become so immersed in it well i mean for me it's I mean, as an artist, my central occupation is beauty. I mean, that's what I, particularly in the Arabic alphabet, I mean, uh, what attracts me to it is uh, the beauty, not just of Arabic calligraphy, but particularly the script I work in. Um, and what, you know, when you're talking about the, the Hebrew alphabet and the the sacredness of the letters, you know, there, there's this concept, gematria, you've probably heard of it, of describing numbers to each of these letters uh, and in arabic that's also uh you know they they call it the i think the jamal haruf the grouping of letters um or the adad haruf the but it's yeah you know, and they actually map on i mean both of these alphabets the, the hebrew alphabet and the arabic alphabet are, are both very closely related because they both descended directly from phoenician um but what's i think is different about hebrew is that the physical shape in Hebrew became very static. Um, whereas in Arabic, the, the tradition was primarily oral initially. So a lot of the Quran, like the first eight Qurans that were um, compiled in a whole sense, uh, was compiled by Uthman, and he sent those to the eight capitals of the Islamic world. And, and those Qurans actually didn't have the nukhat or the dots. Um, uh, and so actually you have North African style of calligraphy has a very different shape and even puts the dots in a different place, um, which if you if you put them in the wrong place, you could drastically change the meaning. But they, I mean, that there's a system there, obviously. Um, and now in Arabic, you have a, a proliferation of, of of different scripts in terms of the, the style of how it's written. Uh, and... And like the script I work in is extremely flowery and it has all of these embellishments. And, um, and it was actually invented by the Ottomans as a way of uh, encryption uh, because the, the Sultan had certain scribes which would add particular embellishments on particular letters uh, that weren't necessarily related to the direct meaning of the text, but that would let his other scribes or his other like other individuals identified, did this letter actually come from the Sultan or did somebody else write this out and then, uh, you know, do this to try to steal this army or this land or whatever. Um, and so in terms of the, the physical shape, there, there's been a, a tremendous evolution and it's, it's actually still evolving. Uh, you have this, there's a governing body called Irsika, which holds competitions every year, um, of the best calligraphers in the world in very particular scripts. And even today, you can see a slight evolution in the, you know, the winner's plates from 12 years ago versus the winner's plates today. Uh, there is a refinement and, and all of that is based on the, 
you know, phi or the golden ratio or this sacred geometry. Uh, and that's finessed and finessed and finessed. And I mean, it'll literally be just like a hairline difference between two letters, but you know, the best calligraphers in the world can identify, okay, this wow is a better shape than this wow, or this Aleph should be, you know, just a half a millimeter taller with this size pen. Um, and so the, the physical characteristics of the script change, whereas the, the language itself should not. Um, or at least if you're reading the Quran, you know, the, the idea of a translated Quran doesn't exist. I mean, there, you can translate the Quran and you can so have a better understanding if you don't speak Arabic, but it's no longer a sacred text once it's been translated because uh, there's this idea that, you know, certain things are not transmiss or untranslatable or if you if you do translate it you risk uh changing the meaning entirely um and, and even and certain surahs of the quran will begin with you know individualized letters so not a word but it'll just say like alif lem meme and then it'll start with the the text and 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 that's a, a genuine mystery i mean no one knows or I mean, people have hypothesized what the the purpose of that is, uh, um, but it you know it it was delivered in that way, and so it shouldn't be tampered with. Uh, and so yeah, I think there is this the idea of yeah, if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know, and you shouldn't be tampering with with things you don't understand or things you don't fully comprehend. Um, and another, I mean, an example of that from the Vedas would be, and that's another thing I learned from Randall Carlson, actually, is, uh, I mean, and, and verified it later with my in-laws, but is that the the speed of light is actually written, or is actually one of the verses in the Rig Veda. It talks about, you know, Surya travels this distance in one Nishima, and, and in other parts of the Yajur Veda, all of these different uh Distances are actually identified. They say, okay, you know, you blink three times in a second and et cetera, et cetera. And then, a, you know, 10,000 pada, pada is, you know, a foot. And so it's like, gives you all the, you know, the data that you can make that calculation. And even back in the 13th century, this mathematician calculated based on that verse, the, the speed of light and, and gave us a number that was with, you know, within a smaller, like we didn't reach that same standard deviation until like the 60s. Um, and and so what's amazing to me is that for all this time, all these priests were reciting that verse and, you know, those numbers that they were talking about and that, you know, there was no, okay, we'll, we'll keep this verse because that makes sense to us of, you know, there was, there was no editing out. It's like, we have to keep that in there. And even if it's, we're not going to find out that it's useful for another 6,000 years, it's, um, you don't tamper with it kind of thing. Uh, and so, and that, yeah, so for me, that was kind of evidence of, you know, if, it, if it's working, let's not change it. And especially, you know, looking back to my 13 year old self in church, you know, they can like, Oh, I know better than this priest, and we can do. You know, it's like, yeah. Well, maybe in this instance you do, but not, you know, not across time or not, you know. Yeah, maybe not even for the week. Yeah, you know. So I, I know I've gone through some of your work. You know, I, I liked uh, your Alan Watts revolver. I think it was a revolver that had the Watts. I think it's behind you. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's this one. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, maybe can you talk about that one, man? Like, what what inspired you to throw Alan Watts a quote of Alan Watts illustrated in the image of a revolver? It's cool. It's really cool. I like it a lot. And I would like to maybe actually also just talk about. I mean, you have some of these behind you. You've got the revolver. You've got an icon over your left shoulder. Um, I mean, could you maybe just talk about some of these pieces that are behind you that we can see here? You've also got a Pulp Fiction scene up on the shelf. Um, yeah, tell us about uh, some of this, man. Yeah, absolutely. So so this icon behind me, uh, this is the first, it's my first icon I've ever made. 
Um, so I'm taking these weekly classes up at the, there's a monastery called uh, Deir Abu, Butros Abu Murad, uh, which is a Melkite monastery up in the mountains um, outside Beirut. And um, so, yeah, I, I just wanted to learn more about icon painting, how to make the paints, etc. cetera. Uh, and the Melkites are kind of Catholic. I mean, it's very interesting to me because they're part of the Holy See. So they're within the Catholic family, but they have all of their liturgy and everything is the Byzantine rite. Um, so that's why they have this uh, uh, Greek Orthodox style icon painting. Um, and basically, I, I want to expand on the working on wood and, and a larger scale. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the, just the way they mix paint and learning how to do this egg tempera. Um, yeah, I, ju I just wanted to study that. And a friend of mine is going to these classes, so I started doing that. Um, and, yeah, so it, it, I guess just wanted to learn another technical skill that also had this tradition involved in it. Um, and then these other pieces behind me, this, uh, so this is the Alan Watts quote that says, uh, yeah, there is no God and Jesus is his son, which is, uh, when Alan Watts is talking about manifest destiny and how the Native Americans interpreted the American expansion across, uh, across the West and this, uh, sort of indoctrination of Christianity upon the Native cultures. He said the one takeaway that the natives learned from this expansion was, you know, in their minds would be that there is no God because of all the horrors that they've seen, but that Jesus is his son because they all keep wanting to give us the Bible and, and teach us these ideals. Uh, and then this particular revolver, this is the, I think it's, I think it's 1855 uh, Navy Colt revolver. Uh, which was one of the first revolvers ever made. And actually when, when they were trying to, you know, the colonists were in Texas trying to survey Texas, the Comanche Indians could fire arrows faster than anyone could shoot a, shoot a gun. Cause back then you still had these muzzle loading rifles and, you know, uh, so you maybe get one shot off, but they could get six arrows by the time you've reloaded your gun. Um, uh, and so this gun is rather morbidly referred to as the, the gun that won Texas. Um, so it's you know, the nature of our technology letting us, well, not only tame the land, but, you know, exterminate or uh, force out the indigenous population. Uh, and then this, this piece behind me is a quote by uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. And it says, uh, and if you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. And um, so this is the the first piece I'd sold to a, a prince or a princess. Uh, so a princess from the Emirates ended up buying the original of this piece. Uh, so this is a print you see behind me. And um, and yeah, it's from a technical perspective. It's one of my, I don't know if I can lift it up here. Well, maybe you can pull up an image of it on my Instagram. But, but uh, yeah, it just has, it's, it's very detailed and has... Uh, from a technical perspective, it's uh, it's a very high density of words, which is not uh, it's kind of a tour de force of technical skill. And uh, and this was one of the first pieces I'd made uh, after the explosion in Beirut, and you know where everything kind of stopped for about a month and a half while everyone was uh, picking up the pieces and and rebuilding and everything. And so that was uh, yeah, it was it seemed like we all gazed into the abyss when that happened and uh, yeah and then it changes something in you or you know you uh, feel that difference you could say um and then uh the piece up above there that's uh it's a piece i did of pulp fiction i think it's ezekiel 12 when he's saying you know the path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by enemies and uh, I will strike down with powerful vengeance and anger those who uh, those who something like who, who fight my lord or um, and so as I seen in Pulp Fiction before he barges in the door and you know holds those teenagers you know it's it's what uh, Samuel Jackson recites before they bust that door in um, 
And then this, my, I think my ex-girlfriend just colored it with different neon. That's a print also that she just kind of colored in with colors on it. Uh, so I just kind of stick it on the wall. Yeah. So how long does it take for you to do like the, the Nietzsche, um, uh, piece of artwork behind you? I mean, how many hours is put into that? I mean, it looks pretty detailed. Yeah. So that one, that's about six weeks, I think, um, maybe a little more, um, so everything I do, I'll draft it maybe six or seven times actually on, on tracing paper. Mm -hmm. So these are like, these are the winglets of a, a missile I'm working on, but this is maybe, you know, that's a pretty clean draft. So maybe that's the seventh or eighth draft it took to, to get that looking okay. Um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll just, I guess it was probably about a month just doing the drafts and making sure everything fit in the right way. And then maybe about two weeks just doing the ink geeking on the same piece of paper for yeah, two weeks straight. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I I don't really count hours. I mean, if I'm awake, I'm, you know, I leave the house, come to the studio and, you know, I'm here till about dinner time every night. And then, and some nights they'll come back after dinner. Uh, yeah. I mean, if I'm awake, I, I usually want to be here. So I, I'm not really... At some point, I tried to count the hours and say, okay, this piece took me 80 hours. This one took, but now I just, I usually measure it in weeks. Uh, yeah. And the longest piece of a single paper I worked on was about six months. Um, and that was an icon of Ahmed Ubamba, uh, which, yeah, had 54 lines of his poetry. Uh, and so because it was all, it was all one continuous text in a very high letter density, um, so it takes a lot more drafts to get everything in balance. A short quote by Nietzsche, but it's written maybe 19 times. Uh, yeah. So once I've balanced certain sections of it, I can kind of reuse those or just tweak them a little bit. Um, whereas if it's a continuous text, then it's, yeah, then it's a significantly more hours. Yeah. yeah, I know that when you reached out to me, you know, one of the things that we had in common was, um, well, I'm a Mason, as you know. And you actually went to school right half a mile from my lodge, West Nashville Phoenix Lodge 131 in Sylvan Park. Um, and you brought that up. Uh, you know, your grandfather was a Mason in North Carolina. And, uh, you know, you're looking to, I think at some point you have some interest in Freemasonry. And, and that kind of got us talking about mystery schools and Lucis and some of these things. Was that interest in those mystery schools, was that there before you kind of embarked on your journey with calligraphy or has this all kind of opened up as you immersed yourself in your art? You know, let's talk about that stuff. Let's talk about, let's talk about your interest in the mystery schools. You know, maybe even the experience you shared with me with the road at Eleusis that you traveled and you know, how you kind of found yourself building a relationship with mysticism. Yeah, well, uh, so I've always been fascinated with the Masons uh, ever since my grandfather passed away. And, um, you know, the Masons, they they came to his funeral and they, you know, at the graveside, they do this particular, um, I don't know if you've seen that ritual that's performed. And, um and I'd kind of read a couple things about him, but I'd never, that was my firsthand interaction with it because my, my grandfather never really talked about it that much. Mm -hmm. um, but he is sort of this godlike figure in my life that was just, um, you know, just an all around great person that everyone kind of reveres in this way of, uh, and just kind of the perfect example of, how you can how you could carry yourself how you should act and um and so that kind of launched me down this road of trying to learn more about the masons um but certainly the masons took a you know sat on the back burner for a while until um i guess in the last five six years i started reading more about it and um and i i really started going deep into this rabbit hole uh after i'd heard about uh, the first time I'd heard of Lucis mentioned, I think, was from Graham Hancock. 
And um, and so and I was curious about this, what he called a psychedelic university that I'd never heard of before. So I I started Googling more about Eleusis and I watched this documentary and then I was totally floored when I saw this documentary because they start walking down the road to Eleusis and this path that from Athens to to the Telesterion. And and in both times I've been to Athens, I've only been there twice. And I, I just kind of walked around and gave myself the tour. And uh, and on both occasions, I found myself walking down this industrial highway. I mean, I did the Acropolis and everything and then just started, for whatever reason, just walking out of town. And there was nothing remotely interesting for a tourist down this road. I mean, it's like warehouses and truck lots and and uh and i'd get about 15 minutes down this road and then i'd look around i'm like okay Everett, you're gonna get mugged like you need to go back to the tourist areas and um uh, in my second trip to athens i again i was just walking around giving myself the tour and then found myself walking down this this you know very unattractive highway through kind of a dodgy neighborhood and then and I didn't really think anything of it. I thought, well, that's weird that you ended up on the same road twice um, and didn't think about it for another year or two until I saw this documentary where they, they're they telling the story of Eleusis and they say, you know, now the path that the initiates took looks very different today. And it's, you know, and then they, the camera goes down that same crappy highway, um, although it goes all the way to Eleusis eventually, but they it's that same shot that I was walking down and I was like floored that, um, yeah, that, so that's that weird dodgy road that I was walking down. Um, and then the more I read about it, the more, you know, when Cicero talks about, you know, he said of all the, the gifts that Athens gave us, democracy is great, but it, it pales in comparison to the, the mysteries. And um, and so, yeah, I just became completely fascinated by the fact that this ritual went on for 2,000 years. And and yeah, I just wanted to to read whatever whatever I thought about. And, um, and so that's, you know, I mean, in terms of the mysteries, you know, I, I kind of thought they were dead. So I, I didn't really, I didn't know how I could any further. Um, and that was sort of left on the table until, um, well, I mean, I don't know if I should talk about this in public, but uh, an Alawite friend of mine talked about his initiation with the Alawites and that he was uh, given a cup of wine that he thought made him hallucinate. Uh, I was wondering if that was related to this, uh, if somehow, okay, if it's an initiation, and of course it's very different because it's, you know, with the Alawites, it's only men, so it's not... It's not men and women and slaves or whoever can afford the the suckling pig, um, and so. Oh, sorry, that's a, and I'm distracted by the phone. And yeah, so that was just kind of a, something I, I knew I wanted to learn more about, but I, I felt like it'd been kind of lost, and 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 I knew that there was some kind of. I mean, it had something to do with this initiation. So whether or not that was a Masonic initiation or a, you know, the, with a psychedelic like an Eleusis or or a or Vedic initiation, I, I knew there was more in that rabbit hole. And um, and so that's what kind of got me, you know, I, I knew I wanted to join the Masons, but I, I, I really wanted to join at my grandfather's lodge. And, and I my stepbrother actually put me in touch with a lodge here in the mountains uh and and this is what got me going on to this rabbit hole of you know where were the masons before the 15th century or before you know even the books that my my grandfather's fellow masons gave me about the masons you know they they talk about the first you know known or the first written record of the masons is in the 1500s um but obviously the lore goes back you know to solomon uh and or maybe Noah even, uh, but the uh, so these so these Druze, this uh, particular mystery sect up in the mountains, they told me that, and I met with this lodge up there, which was 
quite a, quite an amusing experience. Um, but they told me that yeah, we're the Druze are the the original Masons, and they're the ones that have we're the we were the link between uh, Solomon and the Crusaders by his account. Uh, and even the you know the symbol of the Druze is this Eastern Star, this five pointed star with the five colors. Um, which is the same as, I mean, you know, the, the Eastern star that we have in the, in the U S. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I really wanted to just, you know, I wanted to keep going down that rabbit hole and, you know, and I, I'd said that to a few Masons in the States and, and some were very fascinated and some would say things like, well, I can't tell you, you know, there's a few things I can't tell you, but you're on the right track kind of thing. And then other Masons would, Say, oh no no it's not that at all it's something totally different and uh and and so yeah that was always what uh you know what fascinated me and then also that every lodge i've gone into all around the world they all have you know either egyptian deities or greco-roman deities there's always some of this uh classical iconography which um again that's you know i think of the Vedas today are these, you know, I think that they are still, you know, the angels they pray to are the same angels that the Greeks used to pray to. Um, and, and I think there is, I think it's the same belief, just a different, uh, yeah, different way of talking, just different words for the same things. Um, and one thing that's kind of unique about the, the Alawites or the Druze, which I think is also maps onto the Masons, is that you know, there is this, I wouldn't say secrecy, but everything happens behind closed doors. You know, it's not out in the public. And and I think part of that is just a defense from, you know, Islam is a very open and tolerant religion. But then sometimes you get, you know, Salafism or Wahhabism, these, these ultra extremist sects that come along. Mm -hmm. And I think in Europe, we certainly had a history of, uh, you know, ultra conservative uh, streams of Christianity that would come through and just, you know, try to wipe out whatever, uh, whatever religion they found was, you know, abhorrent to them or, or contrary to their interpretation. Uh, so I think a lot of these religions like the Masons are not that it's a religion, but this, these similar groups, you know, they had to put certain things behind closed doors so that, you know, so that they wouldn't be a target in the same way that, uh, and, I, and that was actually one question I had for you is I wonder if, I mean, do you ever think the Masons in the States will have to go back underground? Because uh, here in Lebanon, they're not, you know, you you won't see a square and compass on the front of a lodge. You know, if you go, like I went into the lodge up here in the mountains and, you know, the guy picks me up in a, a car with tinted windows and he, he drives me up to the lodge and there's like, you know, a bunch of Doberman pinchers at the front door with six security cameras and all this like extra. Yeah. Uh, you know, he gave me a fake name, you know, when I <laughs> left Beirut and he said, no, actually I'm so-and-so, but get in the car. And uh, <laughs> I mean, it was this very, and, and, and they're called clandestine lodges. And even, uh, you know, even the, when I talked to my grandfather's lodge in the States, they were, I was asking, you know, is there any lodge I could join in Beirut? And they, you know, there's zero records of these lodges in Lebanon. Uh, like none of them are on their on their books. Uh, and so they say, yeah, whatever, you know, whatever degrees you do there, they won't be transferable. You could do them all again or you could. Uh... And at the end, I, I wasn't didn't end up joining that lodge. I mean, mainly because it's so far from Beirut and I couldn't find the, the local lodge. Um, but also, I mean, it like, you know, so, so he did all this work for all this security at the lodge. And then I get into the get into this office, like the, the center of the lodge, and there's a big tarp on the wall. And and then I said, What's the what's the tarp here? And he pulls it back and there's literally a giant hole in the wall. And he shows me this photo of like a, a forklift that had just fallen through the wall of his of his lodge. And yet, like and yet he still has all these dogs at the front entrance and all this cameras all pointed at the front door, but like I could have just walked through that tarp, but <laughs> so it's, it almost felt a bit like. Uh, That's pretty funny, man. That, <laughs> it's 
Yeah, that, that's that's hilarious, actually. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. Free so Freemasonry is like is fairly decentralized. Um, mm-hmm. There is there is a a general canon of of uh, you know what would be recognized as you know non clandestine Freemasonry, like duly constituted Freemasonry. You know, you have like the Grand Lodge of England and then every state in the United States has their Grand Lodge. And um, and then, you know, there's essentially a record of lodge countries and lodges around the world that are that are recognized, you know, as being legitimate masonry. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, the origins of Freemasonry are are pretty obscure and it's it's a, a mystery to a great extent um mm-hmm. you know like the the masonic narrative uh, solomon's a part of it noah used to be a part of it you know the noahite masonry is is i have not run into any noahite masonry but there's a lot of records and and um old masonic publications that talk about these this noahite form of masonry um but yeah, like, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily look at, I mean, that lodge sounds like, um, sounds like they might've had something else going. I don't know why they didn't fix the hole in their wall, but, um, you know, I don't necessarily just because, you know, I, I have a friend, uh, through, I met through Instagram who lives in Lebanon and he is a Mason in Lebanon. Now, would he be able to visit my lodge if he came to America? No, because he is a member of a lodge that is not recognized um, as canon by, by the Rolodex that we have. But do I view him as any less of a Mason? No, I do not. Um, I think that what's beautiful about Masonry and, and really what's beautiful about just the concept of mystery school in itself, you know, masonry is a mystery school. It's, it's to me, I mean, the reason why it's so beautiful to me is it's, you know, one of the last, at least publicly known, um, mystery schools around in the West, you know, I mean, there's nothing else that I know of that I've come across that can compare to Freemasonry as I've learned it to its social influence, to its spiritual depth. And and just the people that I've met through Freemasonry are uh, absolutely incredible. Um, So, you know, anybody who's a member of a lodge, anybody who who has kind of taken that step to like seek more knowledge for themselves, you know, to, to go and to, to really pry into some of the mysteries. I mean, that's a Mason to me. Um, it's, uh, yeah, when it comes to like Eleusis, you know, I guess one of the things that you mentioned is how Graham Hancock talks about it as being a psychedelic university. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's pretty interesting. I think that's a great way to, to, to put it. It's interesting because, you know, for anybody watching who isn't familiar with with what we're talking about um this is essentially something that was hosted every year for 2000 years and the the pro i mean it was there was a day there was a day where i think it was two or three thousand initiates at once would go into the uh, telestrion and would drink the kaikion and have this hallucinatory mystical experience but I think it, I'm pretty sure it was like a, a six month process of preparation before that day took place of ritual sacrifice travel that then would climax with the actual vision. But what was so cool to me is that, you know, one of the cool things about Eleusis was how, how private it was kept and how much of a mystery it was retained as, but it wasn't necessarily I mean, well, for two reasons, a handful of reasons, but one of them, there were very serious consequences uh, legally. Uh, I mean, pretty sure you would get executed. Um, 
if you were to break your oath towards that secrecy. Mm -hmm. But another thing that I found interesting was a lot of the times people who went through Eleusis, they, they, they had no desire to talk about it with the uninitiated because it was almost like something that you couldn't even explain. Like the experience mm -hmm. that you had at Eleusis, what you saw, what you felt, whatever it was that everybody saw, it it was it was it was so beyond linguistics that to to try to even tell an uninitiated person about what you experienced would just be completely in vain. I mean, it, it, it was the idea of like it, the secrecy was almost a self fulfilling prophecy because they gave people an experience that they weren't even able to talk about. Yeah, and I think that's cool. At, you know when you read about it, when you dive into it, you even hear about how, you know, rulers, you know, would not even claim their kingship title until they went through Eleusis. And the idea, we talked about this, the idea of the political leaders of the world also being initiates, also being mystics. It reminds me of Plato's concept of philosopher kings in the Republic. Mm -hmm. The idea of these wise, wise leaders, wise rulers, and it's almost, I mean, it is a complete joke. Um, the, the characters that I feel are making decisions for us today. Um, I'm, I would almost be, it would be very interesting to take one of these ancient leaders, ancient rulers of the state who went through these things and to sit them down with somebody who's maybe a governor of a state today, just the, 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 the difference of mindset would probably be appalling. Um, but when it comes to Graham Hancock's statement on the psychedelic university, it's, uh, it, you know, I think that, Thing that's interesting i've had my fair share of experience with psychedelics i can absolutely attribute some of the things that i've seen and in, in my experiences with with the way that i think and kind of my my demeanor and the way that i approach things now my appreciation for the world has has flourished since i developed a, a healthy relationship with with the mystical experience but i, I wonder you know, we have these religions that are essentially now devoid of oftentimes that deeply, that deeply, um, that, that, that deeply touching mystical experience. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of people's relationship with deity is a very, uh, going through the motions surface level type of experience. Um, you know, so I, I wonder it's kind of why, like, I started visiting the uh, Greek Orthodox Church here in Nashville, and I just appreciate the ceremony and the ritual and the incantations. I appreciate everything that that happens in that room. That's why I appreciate Freemasonry so much. Freemasonry has preserved this tradition of of incredibly deep and meaningful ritual and ceremony. Um, and nowadays, like, you know, there's a, there's a church near where I live. It's called Zeal Church. And, um, it's probably one of the more popular churches here in Nashville. It's, you know, Protestant, uh, very, like very young crowd. It's like, you know, like a rock band kind of church, you know, nice. but this church doesn't even have a crucifix. There's not, there's not a single crucifix or an image of Jesus in the entire building. Whereas I go to the Orthodox church and the entire interior is, is decorated with some of the most incredible ornaments of religious thought that I've ever seen. I mean, it's just the artwork it's beautiful. It, it goes back to beauty, what we were talking about earlier. Um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I mean, I, I, I wonder, I was, I was talking to 
a philosopher friend of mine. He's a Mason in Mississippi. His name's P.D. Newman. He wrote a couple books about uh, dimethyltryptamine, um, its use in in ancient initiations. But I, I found the you know being that you're somebody who's now diving into iconography, and you've essentially been working with the world of symbols ever since you started your art. Um, yeah, to me, like the idea of a church that has removed symbolism, which is what this church has done, they've essentially removed symbolism, is very strange to me. So maybe, maybe you could elaborate. I'd like to hear you talk more about why you got into iconography, what, what drew you to that monastery, and, and what role you think symbolism and iconography plays in developing um, a spiritual relationship with the creator? Well, I think, you know, in Islam, like, you know, the word means submission. Um, and I think part of it is just to humble yourself. Uh, and so if I look at, you know, I, I used to kind of think, okay, Byzantine icons are kind of, they're all the same. You know, you're just copying something that someone else has done and and it's the same with calligraphy i mean it's you know if you draw the aleph correctly in thuluth every calligrapher is going to draw the aleph the same way uh but it's you know it's not easy to do that uh, and so you know this church you're talking about in nashville um you know it's very cheap and easy not to have a any kind of crucifix on the wall and not to say you know not to say, okay, we believe this. We want to put this icon because we there's value in that image. Whereas, you know, when you don't have any image on the wall, you can you can say whatever you want and you can make yourself the, you know, the mouthpiece of God without having to submit to any of these other protocols or any of these. Uh, and, and I think that ties into what you're talking about in Eleusis when the, you know, even the rulers had to perform the same initiation. But, you know, the last part of the of that walk from Athens to Eleusis um, there was a particular section of it where everyone would everyone that had already been initiated or the local townspeople they would all come and line either side of the road and and just hurl insults and and just curse at these people and just kind of ridicule them and make fun of them and and that was part of you had to you know even the king even the emperor had to um had to be humbled by the by the crowd and and to know okay yeah maybe you're a king out there but uh you know if you want to be in a church in the church everyone's the same you know there's no um and even you know to the extent that there's you know a priest you know he's a priest because he learned all of these he learned all these things from other priests that had taught him this particular protocol um and he's identifying himself of, okay, I'm a member of this clerk. Uh, you know, it's hard work. It's hard. It takes, it's a lot of time and a lot of effort to learn those things. And, you know, you can't just get there with a little bit of charisma. Um, and, and I think it's the same when you go to an art gallery today. I mean, it's, you see the art on the wall and nobody's, you know, it's almost the, the most expensive art is, you know, it's what you get. Away, Andy Warhol says art is what you get away with. And it's, you know, if you can manage to get a painting into a gallery that looks like a piece of crap, you know, that's, oh, you must be a really impressive artist. You know, <laughs> you're really, you know, a good artist if you can, uh, if you can get away with this. And, uh, and I, I think when I approach her, I'm not trying to get away with anything. I'm, I know as a calligrapher, I'm not even, you know, I can make a living at it, but I, you know, in the traditional calligraphy circles, I'm not even, you know, the top 500 calligraphers in the world right now. I mean, there's, uh, you know, by, by trying to approach that ideal, you know, automatically you're going to be putting yourself in a lower place in that hierarchy of whether it's a hierarchy of beauty or a hierarchy of, of the church or, uh, or the, or of the sacred, uh, and every, 
you know, every Mason is equal to his fellow Masons, but, you know, you're, you're still subject to, you know, to the traditions of the Masons that you've all agreed to. You're not, you know, go outside of that framework, uh, because that framework works. I mean, and, and it's, and that's why there's value in it. Um, yeah. So for me, I, I mean, I, I see the, you know, something like the Zoom church is nice because then you can, you can cherry pick what you want from the religion and say, okay, I like this thing and I don't like this thing. Um, and it'll still give you that community for the moment. But, uh, you know, is that church going to be here 20 years from now? I doubt it. Uh, and, and, and what lessons will those people have learned from that institution? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, it seems more like, yeah, you could go to that church or go to a nightclub. There, I don't know how much difference there would be. Uh, I hope I'm not offending any other people watching this, but I mean, if there's no, I mean, you got to submit to something. You know, you have to, um, yeah, you have to put your life in God's hands, or uh, yeah, and see where you know, see where you you go. But you're not always gonna be able to carve that path exactly how you want and if you you know having no iconography on the wall is uh you know you're open to to whatever i guess uh, and, I, and i think it's i mean it there's definitely utility in that okay now we're i mean for instance in, in islam there's no visual iconography on the wall like you can't have um you know there's no images of the prophet muhammad there's no uh, uh and that's why calligraphy in islam has taken on this role that it's been so carefully studied and so heavily refined uh but you'll still only find quran on the on the walls of the mosque i mean it's you'll find every calligraphy that's been drawn in a very exquisite way but they're picking these particular texts and uh you won't even see hadith on the wall of the mosque i mean you'll it's always quran and it's always uh so you're saying, okay, that, and for better or worse, that they're saying this is the, this is our interpretation of God's will, and this is what we're submitting ourselves to. Uh, where and you can't just walk in and bring, uh, yeah, and even, like, and there's, I guess there's extremes of this argument. Like for my, going back to my in-laws, like the first time I went to India to ask him if I could marry my marry their daughter um we wanted to buy like a, a painting for her mother um just to kind of say thanks and uh and so we went to this shop that sells these different um you know vedic icons or or um murti statues and um and they were kind of, her, her and her sister were kind of debating on between these two statues and which one they wanted and, and i was like well you know, we can afford both of them. Why don't we just get both? And then, she, and then they were said, no, 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 we can't do that because, if, you know, she's going to offer puja to this statue. And now we're going to be adding another five minutes to our daily routine if she puts another statue in her house. And if we, you know, if there's been it. And for that, that was, you know, at first I thought that was really bizarre. Like, okay, you have this piece of artwork in your house that you're sort of, uh, I mean, it's not just a piece of artwork for her. It's a, a rendition of of the deity. But uh, you know, you either believe it or you don't. So you either submit and offer your prayer, even if it's a token prayer, even if you know you're half out of breath when you say it. But at least you, you know, you've told yourself this is my my daily routine. I've, if I value this thing, I will not only put it on my on my shelf, but I'll, you know, say my prayers every day to it and make sure that I'm, I guess, checking myself against that. Uh, and you're, yeah, it's, I think the only word to use would be humbled. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're humbling yourself, whether it's to a statue or whether it's to scripture or whether it's to, uh, uh, to the lodge. I mean, you, yeah. you find your place and, uh, Fit in. I think I think that's what happened at Eleusis, and I think that I think that that's just as, I don't know what time it is, but I I feel like we're maybe around the hour mark. 
maybe beyond. Um, yeah, I think we're an hour and a half, it looks like. Yeah. You know, I, th I think that that's where a lot of the value in the psychedelic experience is. And what we should do is we should, we should do another um, call where we dive more into that. But let's each take an eighth of the mushrooms and then we'll uh, zoom each other. Then we'll record. <laughs> You know, it, it humbles you. Like, that's what happened at Eleusis. People saw something that was so beyond anything that they could fathom was real. It, was, it wasn't even that. It was more real than what they thought was real. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you have that experience, whether it's through a psychedelic or maybe it's through, you know, some could say just an, an instant of prophecy or, or you meditate on something and you go in through meditation when you have that experience that is more real than what you thought was real more real than the room i'm in more real than my concept of myself it's i mean you have no choice but to be humble mm -hmm. i mean you have no choice but to but to submit yourself to the question which i mean the, the mystery you know and it's like the mystery is so much bigger than than any of us can ever even fathom. And I, th I like how you brought that up, submission. You know, I think that um, I think that that's important. That's important for us to do. I think in the West, in America, now we have extremely uh, aggrandized uh, egos, and we place an extraordinary value on the self, which I think is great. I mean, I think that there is a role for it. I think that the, the, the ego is powerful. I mean, it can drive change, but especially now with, with the way that social media is going, everybody is essentially like their own little deity. Um, yeah. And it's uh, yeah. I just, I wonder what it's doing to the spirit, but Everett, I really enjoyed talking to you, man. This is the second time we, we spoke, and I'm really excited to talk more with you. Um, yeah, I love maybe, that. Yeah, maybe you, could, maybe you could tell anybody who's watching, like, you know, where they could find you, like your websites, just kind of throw out all your stuff for your websites and your social media. So if somebody wants to follow up, they can find your art. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, I sell my prints at everett.com. That's e b e r i t t e dot com, and uh, you can find more information at everett.org. Or um, yeah, my Instagram is just Everett Barbie. But uh, yeah, pretty much everything's on everett.org or everett.com. And um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah, that's I'm a, a pretty Googleable name. Yeah, you just need my first name, and usually I'm most of the Google results. <laughs> I'll go ahead and just put all your, all your websites in the, in the description of the YouTube video too. But, um, whatever it, yeah, have a nice Sunday evening, man. I don't know what you have going on, but hopefully you have some good time, uh, set aside. Maybe your wife's got a, a nice meal waiting for you back at home. Uh, uh she's back in India this week. She's meeting with some, some doctors there before we go back for the birth in a few months. So, Nice. And so I'll be working in the studio, but, but thank you so much for this opportunity, Warren. You know, I've loved every conversation we've had and, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like I've kind of rambled on most of this time and, and talked to you. And I've got a few questions for you that I'd, I'd also like to ask you at some point. And, um, but yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time for bringing me on and, and, and let me talk about these, uh, these Things that I think a lot of people I talk to just think I sound crazy. So. Yeah, no, it's, so it's nice to have. Yeah, no, it's not crazy, man. It's the realest thing we'll ever know. So, <laughs> yeah, I look forward to, to talking to you more, man. Thank you so much for your time and uh, have a nice evening, Everett. Yeah, you too. Thanks Bye. again, Warren. Hey, see, see you, man. Soon. Bye.